Welcome to FounderLine, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you all with us. Our goal with FounderLine is to provide a forum where people who are interested in startups can get their questions about startups answered. So whether you're a startup founder and you're working on uh, getting a company going, or you're right in the midst of some pretty critical decisions, or maybe you're an employee thinking about joining a company or starting your own company, uh, we'd like to try and help you out. Uh, this is a live show, and so we need your participation. Uh, you can reach us multiple ways. Uh, you can call us. The number is toll-free 1-844-4-FOUNDER. You can email us to help at founderline.com, or you can tweet to at founderline, and we'll see if we can help you out. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Carl Jacob, who's the founder and CEO of Hangtime. Carl's a prolific entrepreneur and an active angel investor. He's been an advisor and investor in many companies, including Facebook, Path, and a bunch of others. Carl, thanks for joining us, and welcome to Founderline. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you here. So usually when we, um, when we get going, I ask a few questions sure. just to kind of warm up get and, me warmed uh, up yeah exactly and and also so people can get to know you a little right. bit if, sure. they, if they don't know you already and um i mean you and i have been in this game for a long time now yep, yep. almost 20 years right and uh over those years the process of getting companies startups uh, companies started has really changed right, right? right like right. like it used to be you'd raise like five million bucks on a powerpoint deck and, right. and yep. you'd go yep. um nowadays you know there's kickstarter there's angel list there's um right. these party seed rounds so maybe um think back through your companies and like Talk about how that's evolved over time. Like, what sorts of things have you right, seen over right. the years? Well, it's it's pretty interesting. So when we started Dimension X, that's probably the best place to go because that was basically my first company. Yeah. And uh, Ron Conway was one of our angel investors there. So it was actually his second investment uh, wow. as, as an angel investor. Wow. We felt very honored. Um, but the interesting thing is back then, Ron was pretty much it when it came to angel investing. Yeah. I mean, there were not many other angel investors at all. So that was the, the, the first part. The other was just the way venture people thought about investing in companies. So I'll never forget, Ann Winblad came into our office one day and I said, hey, you know, what is it gonna take for you guys to fund this company? She said, well, Carl, you need to get profitable and you need to have about $5 million a year in revenue. <laughs> I mean, you think about it, it's just like completely for, different world. For like an A round? <clears throat> for an A round, yep, absolutely. I mean, how are you um, supposed to do that? Exactly, well, and then flash forward to 1999 at Benchmark where we got a term sheet for $7.5 million on a 25 pre-money valuation in about two hours. So <laughs> very, very, very different. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and nowadays, like, you know, you see a lot of these rounds. I mean, most, when you're doing your angel investing, are most of them like, priced notes or are they actually you know priced uh, equity rounds or what what sorts of I, i'd say it's about half half now oh, yeah? you know the the convertible notes the problem you run into is it's the temptation is to keep raising against a convertible note because it's very simple yeah but then you have the overhang and you have all this preference uh stuff that you got to square away which we just squared away with with hang time and it was it was not uh, very very fun well and I, and I remember the math on those is yeah. like kind of non-intuitive right yeah, like exactly like I remember going through spreadsheets with the lawyers and going yeah that doesn't make any sense you yeah, know but yeah. it's all based on the the caps and the discount yeah yeah, yeah exactly. it's a mess so um, uh, you know one of the one of the cool things you've done is um, you were one of Facebook's earliest advisors That's right. and yeah. I, how long ago was that now like seven years ago probably so, yeah, about yeah. seven eight years so yeah. so what, what was it like in the early days? Like, how, how early were you? I don't, I don't even know. Uh, well, it was six guys in a house in Palo Alto. Okay. Um, so so pretty, pretty, cool. pretty early. It's funny. The early days, um, they always would take me to lunch. They, they didn't ever want me to come to, to the apartment or to the house. It was always like... Why is that? Well, because I just think they felt like that was a more formal, you know, area to meet and, and talk and everything like that. Uh, and then they finally did get an office, which ended up being across the street from from the office that everybody knows on University Ave. Um, it was great. I mean, it was a it was a fascinating time. Um, the company, just from the beginning, was growing like crazy. And and of course now, we look at Facebook and we think, oh, they're up all the time and all that. Well, back in the day, in fact, the first time I met Zuck, he'd been up till four o'clock in the morning fixing the servers. Um, <laughs> so they had their problems too. Yeah. Well, like any startup, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and how how did that come about? Like, did you know one of the investors? Or I, you know, it's it's a great story. So uh, I had 
took a vacation and I was sitting on the beach in Cozumel uh, and my phone kept ringing and I finally picked it up and it was Sean Parker uh, who was there at the time yeah. and I'd helped him out at Plaxo uh, and he was pretty thankful for that and uh, I turned to my wife and I said I gotta fly back to, to San Francisco and she's like no way and I'm like Sean I can't go I promised I wouldn't he's like, you have to get on a plane so I actually did a day trip to San Francisco. Oh my God! Uh, and met with Zuck, and uh, about two and a half hours later, I was I was pretty sold on him mostly uh, and what they were doing. And by the time I got back to Cozumel, I had an advisor agreement in my email, and you know, there we went. Wow! Good good thing you took that flight, huh? Uh, well, you know, it's she's funny. happy now that you. have Yeah, done that, exactly. Right? She's she's very happy. Oh, my wife would kill me if I did something. <laughs> <laughs> she almost did. <laughs> Luck, luckily, it's not too far away. Um, exactly. And and now, so so I know you you have Coveru, which is still going right yeah absolutely and, we just and, hired a new ceo there we're very very happy oh with really the progress there yep and and then hang time which um you know you, you raised about six million dollars from a bunch of different yep. investors yeah. and well, one of your party rounds yeah well and I, you know i i've been through that as well and and you know one of the things i remember is um feeling like this sense of guilt about trying to keep everybody up to yeah. date like yeah. you, you know you've taken their money right. some of them are friends of yours some of them are institutional investors right, uh, right. many of them and so i you know, I, I think a lot of people are facing that today, where they raise a million dollars from X people. Right, right. And uh, so, so what what have you done to sort of keep everybody up to date and and just sort of uh, manage that process of having fifteen, twenty investors? Right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, first of all, I admit I'm not very good at it. I, I think that uh, one of the things that that I try to do is personally meet with them as often as I can. I mean, that sounds a little bit crazy, but I don't really want it to be a one way communication, I want to get feedback. Yeah. And when you send out this generic email, that's a lot harder. Um, and you know, if there's somebody I specifically need help from, then that, that always works out better. I do try to do, I'd say, you know, uh, every year like a big update rather than lots of little updates. So like a written a update. Written, uh, a written update. Okay. Um, and then I think the other thing is just, you know, a lot of my investors are professional investors and or professional angels, and they don't really need updates unless you need something, right? And so, you know, many of them are so busy, Ron Conway would be a great example of yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, the chances that he'll actually read it, unless it says something like "I need help," yeah. is 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 pretty low, right? Because he's busy helping other companies, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I I keep it a little lean on the uh, updates. Cool. Well, that's great, and and hopefully that helps you know some people who are going through similar situations. Um, so why don't we um, why don't we see if we've got some questions coming in and uh, see if we can help some people out? Great. Um, again, you can call us or email or wh whatever makes sense for you. Um, we have, uh, we have some emails that have come in. So the first is um, from Leslie. How many angel investments do you make each year and what are the deciding factors when you make those investments? Wow, good question. Uh, so I'd say I'm up, I'll do about 20 to 25 a year. Um, wow. So pretty good clip. Um, like every other week practically. Well, I'd say it's slowed down more recently just as I've gotten busy with other stuff. But yep. uh, you know, if it's a good year, I'll, 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 I'll be at that rate. Now what's happened a lot is I've got a lot of deals that are coming to me from founders of companies that I used to work with, um, friends, and you know, really direct referrals. So most of those are ones that, that I will do just because I know the entrepreneur. Um, and then you know, the deciding factors for me, uh, and I'm a little bit different than most people in the angel investing side, I'm a people person, right? So it's, it's the person first. Um, and then it's the product, because I'm a product guy, I love product and everything like that. Yep. And unfortunately now it's gotten a little, a little bit harder, right? Because I think with the amount of competition you're seeing between startups and a bunch of me too type startups, it, it's really market and market fit and all that, which normally I just look at, like, it's a great team, they'll figure it out. But I just I don't think you can quite do that anymore. Uh, it's it's uh, there you know you see five or six pitches for the same company within two weeks. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's a lot of a lot of competition. And so so do you mainly um, uh, go after the ones that are the personal referrals as opposed to you know scouring AngelList for things yeah. that look interesting? Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's um, I used to do that, and and it just the inbounds gotten to be pretty high. Um, and I've also found that the, the quality that is coming you know, to me is, is pretty high and the referrals are great. Yep. Uh, and it really helps when you know somebody who knows them well or you know them directly. Yep. It's much harder to do the blind introduction. Yeah, thing. absolutely. And what, what, um, what amounts are you typically doing? Like are you-, you Between know? 50 and 100 okay. is, is the normal. Cool. All right, well Leslie, hopefully uh, that helps you out. And uh, 
if you want to reach Carl, uh, he's at Carl on Twitter, so you can uh, try, try and get him there. Um, uh, here's another one from Michael. Um, what are some of the lessons learned at Hangtime in becoming a viral social app? How do you take a social mobile company to profitability? I'm not sure you're profitable We're quite not profitable yet, yet, but yeah. uh, not much. I mean, theoretically, right, you know. Right. Many of my other companies are, yep. are or, or have been sold. Um, you know, I think that the biggest thing we learn about growth and virality is that um, it's the little things, right? And it really, it, it really is running into a wall over and over and over again and just trying new things and being willing to experiment all the time basically, and A-B testing literally everything that you do. I mean, we A-B tested right down to the words we used on the buttons, the colors of the buttons. And wow. what's interesting is that uh, virality, uh, uh, Sean Parker used to call it a black art. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think he's absolutely right, um, because it, it's confusing and, and it can be used for evil. Um, but if you use it for good, I think there's a lot of benefits to it, both to the user and to their friends. So we think about, uh, you know, used to think about in marketing the value proposition. Yeah. We think about the viral proposition. So value proposition is the value you provide to a consumer. The viral proposition is the value you provide to the consumer's friends or the people they share the app with. Got it. And when you start thinking about that, what I find is that you have to have a good viral proposition. If it's not something that people will want to share and other people will want to receive, then you got to rethink your viral strategy. So, so like in the case of hang time, um, you know, this is like a person saying, "Hey, I'm thinking about exactly. doing this, going to this concert or whatever right, it is. Right, right. Do you want to come with me?" Right. Right. And, exactly. And, and so, uh, it has some value as opposed to just. Yeah. Hey, yeah. let me just tell you about something. Right? Well, we even start a little further up the, the stack. We actually say uh, whether they're interested or not. And what we found is that that was a great example. So most other people had forced them to commit to the event, buy a ticket, or say they were going. Like right on the spot. Right on the spot. And of course, nobody wants to do that, yeah. right? But saying you're interested is a very lightweight thing, and it has two advantages. One is people will say they're interested in a lot more things, but even better, they'll share that, right? So if I say I'm interested in something, when I share it, if it just says I'm interested, it's not like, hey, we got to go to this. It's like, hey, no, I'm interested in this. Are you interested in this? And so the response rate is a lot higher. Got it. So if it's like a band that you're really interested in, right. then you might be more likely to say, hey, yeah, I really want to do that. Right, right, right. And we have I'm in for that. So, oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That's cool. I like it. Um, all right, so Michael, hopefully, oh, and then profitability. Right. So, uh, right. well, so are you guys ad based or what, what's the. We, we take a cut of the ticket referrals okay. and, the, and the deals and discounts, and we've got some other things in, in the pipeline. I think the key to profitability and, and getting to profitability is have some kind of revenue generation in the product really early on. Um, you know, at Keen, we were pay for right out of the gates. In 1999, being a pay for service was basically like it's being crazy. an outcast, yeah. exactly. In fact, uh, I won't mention his name, but a, a, a pretty well-known reporter looked me right in the eye and said, uh, you should go back. This is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. You should go back and give Benchmark their, their money back and try something else. I think I, think I remember that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Turned out to be wrong, but that's yeah, okay. Yeah, that, well, that happens occasionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, all right, so let's see. Uh, we have an email from Rob. Uh, you seem to have a knack for finding exits for your startups. Any guidance on how to best position your company for an acquisition? So I think right. all of them have been acquisitions, right? Is yeah, all but two who are that are still operating and profitable. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. So um, what's what's the key? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I've lived through that as well, and and um, you know, I always tell people just just keep going, and and uh, the good. The good stuff will find you, right? right like if you're right. building something of value, they'll come and get you. But right. how, how I, you I, I'm exactly the same way. I think the first thing is not to focus on being acquired, um, because a lot of times you can't control that. And so uh, I think the other thing is that um, you know build your network and and kind of go outside of where you might normally go. And by that I mean oftentimes the companies that acquire you are not the first company you think of and they're honestly not the kind of situation where you go knocking on their door and say we want to be bought. Right. So when we were bought by Microsoft uh, six months earlier we'd licensed our technology to be in their internet browser so we had a good relationship with them we knew who they were they knew who we were they'd seen our code so it was one of those things where 
you know, doing an acquisition was was kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. it's super tough. You hear a lot of these companies all of a sudden wake up one day and say, we're running out of money, we gotta be acquired, and then they start knocking on the door of the corp dev departments at these companies who are already quite overwhelmed, and they don't have any support from the product side. Um, so I think it's key to make sure you go in, in the right door. Got it, and, uh, and you've probably seen this a lot with the companies you angel invest in, right? Right, right. Like, you know, probably a high percentage of them at some point are trying to get acquired yep. or yep. Yep. acquired or something. Right, right. So, so do, they, do they reach out to you and say, hey, help us out, like, yeah. what, what do we do now? Pretty often, um, and you know, I try to work, work really hard to make sure that they're being introduced to the right company and the right person, right? Okay. And so um, that's the other thing is a lot of times people are like, well, let's just email everybody. Well, that doesn't work very well, yeah. um, one. And, and two, you don't have really a, a core theme around why the company should be acquired by that. Like, you know, if it's Dropbox and you gotta start thinking about the enterprise and things like that. Yep. Um, and so you know, if you, you know, do the shotgun approach, that's usually not very successful. Well, and, and I, I think finding the right person makes yeah. such a huge difference, right? Because yep. Yep. that person, if, if they are in a position where they can decide, they just they decide pretty quickly, and then right. it's like, hey, we're buying these guys. Like, go execute this deal, right? That's right. Or whatever right. it is, yeah. and uh, as opposed to like trying to work your way up through corp dev or right. whatever exactly. it might be. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, finding the right person. And I think that's where angels and advisors can really. Yeah, come use. I was just right. gonna say, use your network. That's that's super key, and keep them informed. Uh, Ron Conway is it's, he's very commonly says that the the most times he's seen. A, a startup screw up acquisitions is when he is meeting with somebody and he doesn't know the latest stuff that's going on, right? And so they ask him a question and he doesn't know, uh. right? And so it's got him at that moment at the cocktail party or whatever it might be. So keep your investors informed and, and your wider network, right? Because you never know when you'll find somebody who works in a company. Just this happened to us uh, in one of our companies where one of the employees had a, a relative who just went to work to run product at this company. And it just turned out that she was looking for that exact type of fit and, hmm. it, and it worked out great. So you never know. Yeah, I don't know how Ron does it. Like it, he's, he's got so many companies and just uh, it's like the human uh, Rolodex, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, he's got a good filter. And I think yeah, one of the key things with Ron is that he, he asked that companies only contact him or David when it's a critical inflection point in the company's history. And I, I like that. I try to do the same thing because anybody can help with recruiting. Anybody can help with kind of the day-to-day -day stuff and everything like that. But it's the inflection points where it does take a large network, a lot of effort, uh, and somebody who really knows what they're doing. Yep. No, and he's, he's great at that. So. Um so once again, if, uh, if you want to reach us, uh, you can call us 1-844-4-FOUNDER. You can email us, uh, help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet to at founderline. And we'll see if we can, uh, we can help you out. So um, we've got some more coming in here. Um, th this one actually is an anonymous um, question. Uh, I'm dealing with a difficult board member who does not believe in me, but has influence over the other board members. I suspect he's making a case to get rid of me. Any advice on how to best navigate? Wow. So those are- How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> those are tough situations. I'm sure yeah. you've been there before, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. or, or thought like something was going on yeah. or- yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so, I actually, I mean, I, there, I, I even have uh, successfully navigated one of those at, at Crowdflower. So Lucas, you know, he was um, a board member, did not think he was doing the right job and everything like that. And they moved him aside and, and, you know, he called me and we went through a lot of talking about what was going on and what he thought he should do and what I thought he should do. And about six months later, they brought him back into the CEO position and he runs the company to this day. So wow. they can work out, although I would say those are rare, right? Um, so I think the most important thing is to understand why the board members lost faith in you for, and for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, and if it's something you can fix. Um, and if it's something you can fix, then the next thing is you have to worry about how much momentum the board member has already, right? Because a lot of times in a relationship like that, if, if the things have been repeated over and over again and you haven't lived up to expectations, trying to tell them that you'll get better and you'll learn and everything like that is they're not going to believe you. Yeah. Um, yep. I think it's pretty key to be uh, super upfront and go to the board member, take them out to dinner, and just say, okay, you know, what what do you need for me to do so that I I can stay here? And if I can't stay here, then what's my role and and, and things like that? Because 
it's, uh, I think we're in a much more founder friendly environment, but at the end of the day, people don't scale at the same rate. You know? And uh, when I was at Dimension X, I didn't you know, know very much at all about being a CEO and I made tons and tons of mistakes. Um, and each time you try to learn and, and, and get better. And sometimes it's better to take a step aside and bring in a professional CEO or, or another entrepreneur uh, and learn. Yep. Um, it just, it just, it's a different for each situation. Yeah, what's, what's interesting I think is um, frequently those changes you know, they'll bring in the supposedly experienced right. gray-haired yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, CEO, and then, like, like in the case of Crowdflower, like six yeah. months later, yeah. they go back because. But you know, there's there's something really special about a founder and the vision for the product or the right. market or whatever right. it is. That's right. And and you might bring in somebody who's a professional manager, but they kind of lose their way in terms of the the right. passion for That's right. what it is they're yeah. doing. And I think particularly in the early days, I mean, if the company's at scale and they're doing 10 million a year in revenue, that, that's kind of a different thing. Um, but. I think that if it's a situation where the company isn't quite formed yet and yeah. they don't have product market fit and all that, it's super tough to take a founder out. And honestly, I think that's a board member issue, right? It, it, it takes time and effort to mentor a young CEO. Yeah. Uh, and it can be very painful and they don't listen, right? I didn't, right? Um, but the outcome can be much greater. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine, he actually did an analysis of the outcome of founder-led companies versus non-founder-led companies. And what he found was that on average, the founder-led companies, even if it ended up being kind of an in and out thing where they were on the board for a while and then got back into the CEO spot, I mean, were like four times more valuable than the wow. ones there where somebody was brought in. Yeah, no, and, th and those are tough situations. I, I had a situation once where one of the board members really just decide, okay, you're you're not cutting it, and right, um, right. and the other board members disagreed, but they were afraid to right. go up against the stronger, you know, yep. more vocal person, right. and right. Uh, and you know, it turned out to be a mess, yeah. right? Yeah. And well, that, that's uh, I think everybody's had their first lesson on how to build a real board, and and that's that's key. I mean, it's too late now in this situation. Uh, you're you're not going to go hire a new board member, or yeah, if exactly. you try to, you'll get stopped. But having independent outside board members who have no influence from people uh, on the board, and that's tough in the Valley, uh, is, is hard. And having a board member who's willing to stand up to other board members, particularly if they're the independent, uh, is, is absolutely critical. Because yep. the ones I've seen where they work out, it's because an independent board member steps in and says, this is ridiculous. Yeah. We've got a, you know, check cooler your heads, ego. check your ego at the door, and let's try to work work out this in, in a good way because it can get ugly fast, and I've seen some some pretty ugly situations. Yeah, exactly. So, well, good good luck, anonymous. Uh, I hope hope you figure it out. I hope that's helpful. But um, you know, we we've both been in your shoes, right. and it's uh, it's not a fun space. The other thing you can do is um, if you have some like advisors or people you're friendly with who um, you can go and talk about with this, um, they might be able to give you some creative ideas as well. It's a little hard when we don't know. Right, who anything. The person is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, but we know the feeling, so yeah, uh, yeah. that's not a fun feeling. Uh, so good luck with that. Um, all right, we've got, uh, got time for one more before, uh, before we uh, go to uh, Ask the Lawyer. So this one says, um, it's from Dennis, it's an email. It says, who are some of the best investors you've ever worked with and why? Wow. Good question. Um, he didn't ask who are some of the worst investors you've ever worked with, right, but uh, right. if you those, want to throw those, those in, are, you know, yeah, go, yeah. go right ahead. Those are always fun. Nobody's watching anyway, <laughs> right, so exactly. it'll, it'll be fine. Exactly. Um, well, I'll pick one, uh, and I'll, I'll start with one who, who uh, does not seem obvious. So um, when I was at Keene, Roger McNamee was at Integral Capital. And uh, he wanted to invest, uh, and I really liked Roger. Uh, but everybody's like, you know, you'll never be able to get a hold of him. He's so busy. And it's funny, they could not have been more wrong. I, I called Roger at 10 o'clock at night when he was playing a gig. He has a band. Yeah. Um, and he texted me back and said, hang on, I'll be off the stage in just a little bit. <laughs> like during a break or During a break. Right? So he called, all, yeah. Well, I hope he wasn't playing and, and texting. Yeah. Said, well, maybe, yeah. maybe you can do that. Yeah. Uh, and he called me back, and after that, we were trying to recruit a VP of marketing. He called the VP of marketing and spent two hours on the phone with him till about you know 12:30 in the morning. So that kind of 
dedication and willingness to, to you know go to bat is great um, you know we've talked about Ron Ron's fantastic yep. uh, you know the guy can pretty much get anything done um, I think Eric Chin at Crosslink has been fantastic you know Eric is one of those guys who is very people oriented and he backs entrepreneurs and I've watched that guy you know stand up to people you know to his kind of own damage right I mean they like he would take his reputation and put it in front of the entrepreneur and 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 really protect him and the company, uh, and that 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 takes a lot of guts to and do. And is he an investor in he your is. company? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So, so Dennis, uh, hopefully that helps out. I mean, th there are a lot of great investors out there. Um, I, I think it's one of the most important things you can do is like yeah, sort through yeah, and yeah, figure yeah. out check references. Like I always yeah. check blind references on people I haven't worked with before, you yeah. know, new investors, because yeah. you just never know what you're going to It's brand new. You know, the thing out, the two things I'll do is I want to talk to two CEOs you fired, uh, <laughs> which is always an interesting one. Yeah. Um, but, but I think the other is um, something that, that, that a friend of mine said, he says, well, it's not the partnership, it's the partner. And that's true, except these days people move around a lot. And I've got at least two companies right now where the partner left the firm and they replaced that partner with somebody else who either didn't know the business, right, or was just not a fit for the company. Um, and that's super hard to work through with the company. It, yeah. it's, it, it can be a company killer. Yeah, no, those are, those are tough situations for sure. So, um, all right, well, um, take a minute, relax. Yep, and uh, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, sponsor thank yous. So, um, uh, you know, this, this show wouldn't be possible without the great support we get from our sponsors, uh, Ustream and Auric. So let's, let's start with Ustream. Um, we've been working with them since the, right before the show started and got in touch with uh, Brad, who's their CEO. And the team there has been fantastic. Uh, everything from initially getting us up and running, which, which was a very fast process, to we took uh, Founderline on the road to Europe uh, a couple weeks ago and trying to do remote uh, broadcasts from London and Paris, which was, uh, which was fun. Um, j just every time we've we've needed their help, uh, the team there has has uh, come through and helped us out. If you're thinking about um, uh, streaming a show or some meetings or whatever you might be doing, uh, Ustream is the best, and you can uh, you can go and find out more on their website. It's uh, Ustream.tv, and uh, I'm sure they'll take as good a care of you as they have of us. Um, I also would like to thank Mitch Zukli at Oric. Um, Mitch uh, and I have known each other for a long time and have worked together. And I, I always tell um, startup founders and entrepreneurs that um, your lawyer is one of your most you know, precious uh, advisors. Like, yes, they work on the legal stuff and the contracts and all the, the financing docs and whatever else. But more importantly, they're, they're one of your trusted advisors and they can help you through situations like we, we heard earlier where you know, a board member might be unhappy with your performance or whatever it might be. They've seen so many of these transactions and have been through so many situations. Um, they're just a great resource, uh, you know, to, to work with. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about getting a company going or you're looking for some help on the legal side, uh, Oric is, is a great firm and, and lots of really good people there. Um, you can go find out more at their website. It's oric.com and, uh, and the, I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll help you out. So um, now it's time for what we like to call Ask the Lawyer. And uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Mitch Zukli, who's the chairman and CEO of Oric, um, join us every week and uh, where we can discuss a topic uh, you know, that's, that's relevant to startups. Um, and we have Mitch on the legal side and, and uh, Carl who can sort of represent the, the founder and uh, angel investor side. So um, uh, Mitch, are you, are you with us today? Hey Joe, great to talk with you. Great to talk with you, Carl. Thanks. Hey, uh, great to have you with us. Um, so uh, today, you know, I thought, uh, you know, Carl and I have both done a bunch of companies, and um, I thought it'd be great to talk a little bit about founders. You know, when you're getting um, a company started, uh, there's always this little bit of an awkward uh, conversation you need to have where you're trying to decide, okay, you know, there's two of us or there's three of us or whatever the number is, how are we going to um, set this company up, uh, split the equity, you know, what happens if one of the founders doesn't last very long? Um, 
you know, I, I sometimes call this the founder prenup just to make sure you, uh, you at least have the conversation and more preferably you write the stuff down. I've seen so many situations where um, founders are afraid to have this conversation and they get part way in and they right. discover, oh, I didn't realize you were thinking that, right, uh, you know, right. I was thinking this. And um, so Mitch, you know, maybe you can start us off. You, you've seen so many of these, um, uh, maybe you can start us off with some thoughts on how to best um, structure these relationships uh, between founders. You bet, Joe. I'm happy to. You know, the first thing I, uh, I'd say is there, there's two questions. One is, how do you do the split, and then how do you go about uh, mechanically affecting it? And let me just start with that concept of the split. I, I think, you know, the most important thing, of course, is for people to feel like they're informed and that you're making a fair decision. And, you know, obviously a CTO is worth something very different from a junior programmer. And if you have a founding team that's coming together with two or three people with very different levels of seniority, it doesn't seem fair for the split to be, you know, a third, a third, a third. Uh, it's, it's definitely not, uh, not right for it to be equal. And it will likely be undone by an angel investor or a VC who's coming in later. And so I start by the idea of, as you approach this, get informed. There's plenty of data out there. There's a variety of angel investors or advisors or board members or, or lawyers who can give you some data about what's market. And that should be a starting point for your discussion. Shouldn't be the ending point. Uh, but you should you should be informed about uh, what what do the relative splits look like uh, between the the positions that you think you'll have in the company in the long run. Second thing I'd say is much more important than uh, the you know the actual details of how you draft it or how you come out on double trigger or whatever it is 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 just to have the conversation. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. By far the most dangerous thing that can happen to a company is you defer the conversation and somehow uh, it's just awkward, you push it off, and then people's expectations don't meet and the founder disappears. And they get pissed off, they think that, uh, that they're, they're not being treated fairly, they're surprised that the, the issue didn't come up sooner, and they leave. And that, that concept of the phantom founder, one who was a founder, who contributed importantly to the IP of the company in some way, and then disappears, that can be really problematic for the company much more so than coming up with a mix that turns out not to be right because you'll have the benefit of having others who care about the company, other stakeholders, those who have written checks, who can help fix it later on if the relative mix isn't right. But if you defer it, don't have the conversation, and someone takes off because they were treated unfairly, that can be a really uh, big problem for the company. Sounds good. Thanks, Mitch. So, so Carl, you've seen a bunch of these, right? right you, you've right. lived through it yep. yourself, yep. and you've also probably coached people on right. their situations. So what, what, uh, what words of wisdom would you have for somebody who's thinking about this or going through the process right now? Well, I think it's to, you know, the big, big, one of the big things is to start thinking early on about the fact that you might not be together, right? And, and I think that's, that's a hard thing to talk about before you get married, and it's a hard thing to talk about before uh, you uh, join somebody with a company. Yep. Um, but I think it's absolutely critical because a lot of times founders do leave, especially nowadays. I mean, it, it is amazing to see the number of founders that, that move around, and I think that's perfectly fine, but then you need to plan for that. And normally that's through vesting schedules and all that, but, but I, I, what I like to do is, is have a frank conversation about what might happen and ask the person to be flexible if it does happen. Um, beyond the terms of the agreement and everything like that, I think you just have to have a shared understanding that if it doesn't work out, that founder won't be contributing to the company anymore and the company has to move on and, and therefore they need to you know, have the ac some equity back and, and they probably have to, you know, titles changed and all that fun stuff. Um, I, I think the other, I've got tons of founder stories, um, but I think one of the biggest things that I see is where the vision of the company is out of line with one or or multiple founders and that happens in a whole bunch of different ways companies pivot and all that stuff and if the founding team can't make a decision on which direction to go that's usually when i start talking to them about are you sure you should all stay together and and i had one where they all came to me and they each one of them had a different vision for the company and hmm. they said which one should we do I said, well, that's not your problem. <laughs> your problem <laughs> is that you guys should figure out if you want to work together. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they came back a week later, and the CEO left and uh, founder, and the two other guys stayed and, and went on to build a great company. Got it. So, Mitch, um, 
What, any uh, advice for people? Like, like, how do you how do you document this stuff, or what sorts of agreements, or how how do you? Uh, is it a letter between the founders? Is it some of the you know the vesting schedules? How how do you handle that stuff? Well, usually it's done through the drafting of a restricted stock purchase agreement, where you put everything in there, combined with some sort of a, of an offer letter. It doesn't usually be a formal employment agreement, but just a very simple offer letter around salary. But almost always, the stock documents are, are in a restricted stock purchase agreement, which has the vesting contained in it. And then the other terms of employment around comp and title and stuff go in a very simple, uh, you know, kind of offer letter. And uh, the simpler, the better. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, the most important thing is to reduce it to writing. You know, and, and email is better than nothing. Uh, right. And I would, again, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Sounds good. Well, any any closing thoughts, Mitch, or uh, or we're good? I think we're good. Just get it get it down in writing. The sooner is better, and be flexible. I think that you know, Carl mentioned that concept of of having an agreement, whether it's moral or legal, that you guys are going to be people are going to be flexible, and you can look your co-founder in the eye and feel like you're going to do that. You've you've done the right thing. Okay. So that's the key. All right, great. Well, uh, thanks, Mitch. We'll uh, we'll talk to you again next week. All right, catch it in. Thanks so much. See ya. All right, all right great. That's uh, that's Mitch Zukli, who's the uh, chairman and CEO of Oric, who uh, joins us every week for the Ask the Lawyer segment. And um, uh, you know that 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 stuff is so critical. Like just figuring yeah. that that out. And um, uh, you know, if you have a lawyer, uh, it's helpful to have them involved in the process. But even if you don't, um, have those frank conversations. Get that stuff sorted out. And um, and be ready to change because there's one thing in startups like it changes something's going to change the team's going to change the idea right, right. uh you know the investors the market what, whatever happens um you got to be ready for it so um uh so some great advice uh from mitch and carl there so um once again if you'd like to reach reach us you can call us one 844 founder you can email help at founderline.com and you can tweet to at founderline so um, let's go back to the questions here and see, uh, see we've got a few more here. Um, so this is an email from Manny. Uh, we've raised one million in seed funding, funding, but are running low on cash and having trouble raising more money. Any advice on the best way to do this? On the best way to raise money, I assume. Right, right So right. happens to a lot of companies, right? Yeah. Uh, we've both been there right the clock clock's ticking down and you're right. trying to figure it out so um, uh, without knowing exactly what the company is or the situation um, any right. any advice well my, my first thing that I do in a situation like that is uh, counsel entrepreneurs to go back to their existing investors who believe them at one point or believed in them at one point um, and ask them for more money because at the end of the day you want to know two things you want to know if they'll put more money in and they believe in you and you want to know if they won't right uh, because if you go raise money from other people they're going to ask those people whether they're going to put in their pro rata or stay involved or whatever it might be yeah um, the good news is I think that multiple seed rounds are, are not unusual anymore um, and also your existing investors are the people who are already committed to it and they'll lose their money if if you don't go go forward so yeah. that's the process I would go through and then from there again it's you know leveraging your network go to those investors and say who do you know and, and actually really sit down with them and give them the pitch and say here's the traction everything like that and and hopefully they will come up with some names that, that will be useful yeah that's great advice the, the other thing I'd add is um, uh, there if you're having trouble raising money there's probably some problem that yeah. maybe <clears throat> nobody's telling you like yeah, like that's right. you suck or right, right. or there's a problem with the team or yeah. we don't believe in this market or whatever and so um, you know, I, I think it's critical to go to somebody you trust who's one of the investors and say, look, can you level with me? Like, right. I need to know w why are we having this problem? And you, you right. probably know already, like maybe your numbers are low or whatever it is, but um, uh, that can be really helpful. And maybe you can right. fix that thing, what yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, um, yeah I think too, too uh, a lot of founders forget that um, you don't get to raise money when you want to. You get to raise money when the market will accept you. And the number of companies that I've had to sit down with and say, don't raise now. No matter what, you, you're not ready. You're going to fail. And if you fail, you can't go back to those guys. Um, it's very difficult to get a deal 
back through a partnership, even six months to a year down the road. Um, so, you know, my thing is make sure you're ready to go out that door. Um, and, you know, some of them listen and some of them don't. And the ones that don't usually call in a month and say, wow, we've had 50 pitches and all of them have said no. I'm like, yep. And, and think it, of all that wasted time. Well, right? and you like, just, you know, at that point, you got to extend the, the runway somehow. You know, yeah, you got to adjust yeah. the staff and everything like that. Get the product to where it needs to be because it, it really changes quickly as yeah. far as it's very dynamic. It's a marketplace. And that's one thing that a lot of people, that was one of my first real lessons in the Valley was that venture investing is a marketplace. And it, it really matters the company that came in before you. It matters the company that came in behind you. And it matters what everybody's talking about at the cocktail parties. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll put you on the spot. What's what's one of the toughest situations you've been involved in? You don't have to name the company um, if it's something you don't want to say. But you mean in fundraising, or yeah, like you know, the cash is running low, and maybe the numbers aren't there, and you got to figure yeah. it out. And well, one, one of the toughest was a company where uh, it was three co-founders, myself and, and two other guys, and uh, we were running on fumes, big time. And it was a terrible time to raise money. Great example of you don't get to raise when you want to. But we needed the money. And uh, we got a term sheet. Uh, it was for about half the company. And I think it was a three times liquidation preference. Oh. <laughs> and some kind of funky carve back if we sold the company for less than $20 million in the first year. Uh, and we actually turned that term sheet down. And Which is pretty hard at that uh, point, right? Trust when me, the, the look on the faces of, of these two founders, I, I wish I had taken a picture because they were crushed. Um, but thankfully, they, they trusted me. Um, and we went on to raise a angel round. Uh, and then we went back and raised a, a, a much better round, much better terms. Uh, and, and the company is quite successful today. Yep. Um, but have we, had we taken that term sheet, even if we'd been successful, we would have had about half of, of what you know, hopefully we'll have when yeah. this uh, has yeah. a liquidity value. Well, and, and I, I think that's critical. Um, you know, a, a deal with bad terms or a deal with someone that either you don't trust or you don't like or right. like the, right. they're a little bit of a shark mentality. And, right. and um, you know, maybe it'll work out OK, but most likely some something bad's going to yeah. happen. Right? Yeah. Well, they, it was funny because the, the, the venture firm had a, another term sheet out for another company that ended up being a competitor. Um, so the, the moral of the story is that company went out of business basically and sold for less than they invested in it. So, wow. So, uh, so bad karma as well. Exactly. Uh, all exactly. right, good. Um, well, so, so here, here's a, another email, sort of in a, in a related uh, topic from Len. What's the most difficult situation you've ever faced as a founder CEO, and how did you manage it? So I don't know if it was that one or, or something else, but... Uh, there are so many, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, well, uh, tell us all of them. Uh, yeah, no, no yeah. but, you know, um, I, th I think these stories are so great for people because they realize, you know, all right, it happens even, even to everybody. Successful people, you yeah. know, they go through through yeah. tough times. So, um. Um, I, I think probably one of the most difficult was was laying off about half the staff at one of my companies. Um, and uh, the, the really hard part was the company was doing quite well. Yep. Um, but it was after 9/11, and um, there was just no clarity as to what was going to happen in the world whatsoever. Um, and it, 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 it broke me. I mean, it was really, I yep. mean, it's one thing to lay off 10 people or five people, but this was a lot, this is 40 people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And people had families and kids and everything like that. And so um, that, that's a tough one to get through. I think Ben Horowitz does a good job in his book talking about what that really feels like. Yeah. Um, uh, it sucks. Yeah. And I don't think you ever hire the same way ever again. Um, because from then on, it's in the back of your mind that if things don't work out or the company goes sideways, that that better be a person that you're going to keep on the bus, so to speak. Um, it, it definitely makes you think a lot differently about, about the hiring process. Instead of just filling a seat on the bus, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you always think you've got to have the person. And it, especially now, you're hearing a lot of this, like, we've got to have somebody now. And what I found is, one, you, actually, you don't. Um, and two, um, a, a bad hire, either as far as the work they do and the quality of the work and everything like that, can kill you. But even worse, so can too much headcount. And you know, 99, 2000, there's so many companies that were built during that time frame that were not financially viable. Yeah. Not because they wouldn't be big companies one day, but the cost structure of that company wasn't going to survive any kind of downturn. And, and we've got that problem now, yeah. right? Yeah. And when the downturn comes, and it always does, right? 
those companies, what do you do? Go to everybody and cut their salary in half? Nope, you lay people off. Yeah. And so I think that's something that people don't think about a lot. They don't think about, you know, am I building a structure of a company that can survive in the good times and the bad times? Unfortunately, when you're building a company during the good times, you tend to only think about the good times. Yeah, well, and, and the other aspect of layoffs is, you know, it affects the people who are left behind pretty That's severely right. as well, right? Yeah. Like they're yeah. working with their friends and yeah. Yeah. maybe you kept, you know, one guy and not the other and, and they yeah. were buddies or, you know, whatever, it, yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, yeah, and I think that's, that would, I got a great piece of advice way back from Bill Campbell and he said, you got to focus on the people who are going to stay, right? You, you can't get too sidetracked and, you know, the people who are leaving are important and they're going to go on and have careers and you want to stay friends with them and everything like that. But don't lose sight of the fact that, that, you know, there are survivors and, and you've got to focus on, on those people because if you don't and you think that the easy part is over after you've laid off a bunch of people your work is just starting yep no layoffs layoffs are no fun L luckily I've never had to I've never been the CEO when I, I've had to do that but I've I've been on teams yeah. where that's happened and it's it's uh, it's yeah. a really horrible situation yeah. Yeah. so uh, so good question Len thanks uh, thanks for asking um, Let's see, uh, we've got another one here from Anil. Um, who are some of the best product or engineering people you've worked with and why? So I don't know if you want to name names or if you just want to talk generically about uh, right. uh, some of the people. Um, well, the product one is an easy one. I mean, that'd be, that'd be Zuck and Sean. Um, I actually think Sean Parker doesn't get enough credit for his prowess in, in product and, and, and really, I mean, inventing most of the viral techniques that people use today. Um, and what, so why, why do you say that about those two guys? Like what, what is it about them? Um, is it like the <clears throat> intuition? Is it the ability to convince everybody to go in this direction? What, what sorts of things? I'd say, you know, to the, to the first side of the question, I, I think um, it was really Zuck's deep, deep caring about how people acted and why they did things. He was a cognitive sci major um, and he really wanted to understand how people worked. Hmm. Uh, and we, I liked that a lot because I was a biomedical engineer. So th that was one of those things where I hadn't found somebody who had an engineering background who just cared that much about how people connect and why they connect. Uh, on why the, are they poking me, right? Right, what, exactly. What's, what's the I, dynamics you know, and you see that in the design of Facebook, even back then. Like it, it was, it was much more a um, psychological and and kind of brain brain product or experiment, I guess I would say, early on, that than it was kind of a normal web product at the time. People just didn't build products that acted like Facebook yeah, back then. Yeah. Um, and then Sean, he, that guy could sell anything, right? So um, he was amazing at doing that. Um, on, on the engineering talent side, I work with uh, a guy, Mark Halstead. I've worked with him for about 15 years. He's been with me since Dimension X. Oh, multiple uh, companies. Multiple huh? companies. And what I love about Mark uh, is he just blows up all the myths that are out there. So he's our chief, chief architect at Hangtime. And one minute he can be writing the architecture document and helping a mentor another engineer. Uh, and then the next minute he can be writing the most clean code you've ever seen in your life. And, and I just think people get confused about, oh, if I'm gonna become the CTO, then I manage people all the time and I don't code. He is proof positive that uh, you don't have to do that. And, and I think that the people who keep their hands in the code are better managers and better leaders, if, particularly on the technical side. No, I think that's critical. Like, if if they're not willing to still get their hands dirty, it sort that's of says sign, something. Right. About exactly. That, right? That, that's a sign, right? Exactly. That's like a those, marketing person who won't run ads. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the, but the, those people are pretty rare, right? Like, yeah, the, very. The, you know, the very. ones uh, they tend to break out either into the people who write code and the managers, right? right. So that's right. That's finding right. that one person is pretty special. Yeah. So yeah. So hopefully you took uh, when you guys wrote up the founder documents, you know, you guys. Uh, I think we did okay. I oh, think he's okay. pretty happy. Good. Well, uh, he'll, he'll see this later, hopefully, and he'll, uh, he'll let us know. So, um, uh, so great, great question, Anil. Thanks for sending that in. Um, we, we have one here from Ted. It says, uh, I'm seeing signs that my startup is not doing well. What's the best way to truly evaluate that? I'm worried that if I ask the CEO, he'll think I'm not a team player. Thanks. So 
Well, that 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 question has like multiple problems right, in it that right. I can uh, exactly. you know you can't go to the CEO right, for fear right. of uh, retribution or whatever. Um, you know, this person, uh, if if that's his real name, uh, is having issues. So uh, tough situation, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard. Um, look, all companies have problems. Um, real or imagined. Um, sometimes it's the one that you imagine that are the worst ones. Uh, I, I think there's a couple different things. I mean, obviously go to the CEO for sure, right? I, I th if it's a decent CEO at all, um, they'll try to answer your questions as honestly as possible and, and hopefully you'll get some resolution. I would say that, that one of the things I think that uh, has been overlooked and uh, in the past three or four years is that different people in the company have very differing sets of information. And the CEO you know, should have the most complete understanding of the business, the marketplace, and all that. So sometimes what looks like the company's not doing well uh, can, can be something very, very different. The CEO's decided they're not going to focus on that area, or um, they're pivoting the company and they just haven't you know, figured out the right uh, vision and, and product pitch and everything like that. Um, so I, I think that... Um, I'll call it second guessing the CEO. Um, I think is important. I think you you know you bring it up, but realize that that, that you are the best person to do your job because you have hopefully the most complete information about yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. That's the CEO's job too, and it may be just one of those things where he says, "Well, look, I I get what's going on in the marketplace. I have an understanding where the company needs needs to go. Um, you got to trust him. Now, that's tough, but that's that's the CEO's job. So so how do you how do you keep your employees? In the loop, like, do you guys have uh, all hands meetings, you know, once a week or? What? Yeah, we're we're pretty tight knit. We're only eight people, right? Okay. So, so that's um, like all in one room. That, that's probably. the perfect size yeah. where where information flows almost instantaneously. But every day we do a stand up every day, where everybody talks about what they're working on, including me, um, and then we'll have like a, a company get together where it's more talking about strategic and everything like that. But we're, we're pretty lucky. Once you get past twenty, then then you really do have communication issues, and you have to really start basically you know, saying over and over again, here are the core values, here's the mission, here's why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. Because you know, you're bringing on so many new people that you got more new people in seats than you actually have existing employees. Yep. Now those, the, those early days, like the sort of zero to 10 employees, yeah. like yeah. They're, they're so great because um, uh, especially in the open office era, you yeah. know, the last right. whatever, five to 10 years where Everybody's right there, and yeah, it gets a little annoying if you're trying to get some work done right. and everybody's right. chatting. But right. um, but you you can almost know like, let's say there's a biz dev guy over there, like you kind of know how it's going, right? right? Just right. From, whether he's yelling like, in the phone or not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pulling his hair out or right. whatever right. it might exactly. be. But uh, no, those those are the uh, the the great times in a company. Um, all right, so here's here's another uh, email from Marissa. I don't know if this is the Marissa, but I I, I think not based on what I'm seeing here. Um, uh, we're deciding between two investors. We like one better than the other, but the valuation is about 25% worse. Other terms are similar. We've tried to get the valuation higher for the investor we like, but he won't move. What would you do? That's easy. Go with the investor you like. It's a no-brainer. So why? So why? <laughs> well, uh, I got some great advice early in my career, and uh, it, it was, I think it was actually Ron who said, valuation now doesn't matter valuation when you exit is what matters. And so you can negotiate around this. I see, I see founders over-optimizing for valuation, um, sweating every you know, million dollars in, in cap uh, or, or pre-money valuation. In the end, it, it doesn't matter. If the company goes to zero, nobody cares. Yep. If the company's a huge success, guess what? Nobody cares then either because everybody did well. And you can have sour grapes. So, so I think that it's, it's critical to have great investors. You, if you're having second thoughts now about whoever is offering you a more pricey term sheet, then you're, you know, you're already in trouble. I think the other thing is too, you gotta consider the other side of it. If you're getting a term sheet for hire, and look, I, I've negotiated plenty of term sheets. I think I've done 22 term sheets and I've pitted people against each other, but I always picked the person I thought would be the best investor for the company. And that's, that's very hard to do, um, but at the end of the day, it's about building a great company over a long period of time. And you'll forget, you'll forget even what the pre-money valuation was on yeah. this round. Yeah. And this other investor may have to offer you know, higher terms in order to get deals. I mean, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a marketplace. And so yeah. if you're not sure about 
um, how people perceive you as an investor and you don't have as good a reputation or whatever it might be, you got to pay up. Yep. No, that's, I, I think that's great advice. And, and just knowing who the person is and, yeah. and really trying to get behind that. If you haven't worked with them before, trying to understand it. But, yeah. uh, um, you know, I, I, can, I can probably remember some of the valuations over the years, but yeah. at the end, it's like, did the company succeed or not? That's and, exactly and, right. Uh, do, right. Do you get there? Now, now, if the number was higher, like let's say it was like 50%, yeah, then, then you true. gotta start thinking about it and yeah. also wonder, why is there such a but it, it gets dicey i have a company that i'm an investor in um where they got offered a term sheet at three times anything they, they'd imagined was going to be possible right after their series a um but it turned out that the terms were were awful right so you have to be careful there too i mean the, usually it's not apples to apples and yeah. so when you start digging into the term sheet that is higher price or lower price you know you got to look for things like liquidation preferences and ability to sell your stock and things like that yep makes sense um all right well we're running out of time here i think we've got time for uh for one more so um Here's a question from Bob. Uh, what are the pros and cons of convertible notes versus equity investments? <laughs> so this comes up all the time, right? We, yeah. we, we hit on it a little bit earlier. Um, so what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, so this is convertible notes are easy. Um, they're quick. They give the investor zero control over the company or say over the company. Uh, and you can do lots of them. Right, so that that's the great thing about convertible notes. Uh, they're almost addictive, right? Because you, if you want to, especially wanna, nowadays, it yeah, if you like want to raise more money, it's like, going. oh, just put a new. I yeah. mean, we did three caps of convertible notes at hang time, right? Wow, so, uh, in like two years or something. Three years, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, however, um, the downside is a, a couple things. One, you tend not to have a true lead investor, even if you have somebody who put more money in in their convertible note. They just don't think about it the same way. Right. And it's not, it's debt. It's not really an investment until they, they do a round. Um, I think that um, if, I, if, if it was me, and I'm gonna go back in time and, and redo how we financed hang time, I probably would have raised about a million and a half, maybe $2 million on convertible notes and then done a series seed. Okay. Um, now the problem with that and the series seed, especially when you're a young CEO, is it's a lot of documents and it's probably a lot of stuff that they don't understand. Um, but guess what? That's your job. So yeah. it's time to man up or woman up and go in and read the docs and work with your lawyer and figure out what's really going on um, because those terms matter and it sets the foundation for the company in the future. I've got a situation right now where we're negotiating a series seed and the CEO said, well, I, I think I can get these terms changed in the next round. I'm like, absolutely not. If a VC sees those terms in the series seed, guess what? That's the floor. They want right? more over yeah, that, right? Yeah. Um, so I, th I think it's it's actually the answer is both. I mean, I would do convertible notes, especially early on, right? Because the, the, the time for you and the team to deal with the series seed really, really early on, it, it's probably not worth it. Yep. No, great advice. And, and I, I think, you know, this comes up a lot. There are even certain investors who won't do one That's or right. the other, That's right? right. And yeah, so yeah. sometimes it depends on, okay, who's the lead person and right. what does he or she want in terms right. of the, the financing structure. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I tell people it, it really depends on the situation. Yeah. That's, but, a, that's uh, right. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Carl, thanks for uh, being such a great guest. If you... Um, if you want to follow Carl, uh, he has the handle at Carl, K-A-R-L, on Twitter. So uh, follow him and uh, you can ask him questions. Uh, tune in next week for another episode of Founderline. Our guest will be John Lilly, who's a partner at Greylock. Uh, John's been involved in a bunch of great companies, uh, both as an operator as an, and, and as an investor, including Mozilla, Instagram, Dropbox, Tumblr. Uh, it's next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, thank you once again to our fantastic sponsors, Oric and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. We're at, at Founderline. And uh, you can email us questions in advance for John. The email address is help at founderline.com. Uh, check out our website. Uh, you can subscribe to updates. We'll let you know who the upcoming guests are and what happened in the last show. Um, you can also uh, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next week.